Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. How are you? <laughs> Great. Um, I see a, a lot of uh, CA enthusiasts here in the room, and uh, it is great also to see about 25, 30 people joining us through the webinar. So that's perfect. And welcome again to another Covering Environments uh, seminars uh, on a beautiful Tucson afternoon. Um, it's great to see you all again. And we have another special seminar today for you. So my name is Murat Kasira. For those of you just joining us for this uh, the presentation and those also from the webinar, uh, uh, I'm a faculty member in the Biosystems Engineering and the Director of Controlled Environment Agriculture Center. I would like to, before we start, I would like to thank uh, several uh, special people here. Uh, Danae Pantoja, our program coordinator <laughs> here at the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center, and uh, Dave Bogner. Uh, our uh, specialist in, uh, in support for the IT, as well as Rafik Gruner. Uh, he's our original uh, program uh, coordinator for the Covering Environment Seminars. He's traveling today, so he cannot be with us. So I kind of took over his, his uh, uh, place for today. Um, today, we will be talking about urban agriculture, an industry that is really creating unique opportunities for commercial growers, an industry that helps to produce, to process and market the produce for local markets and, the, and consumers are really uh, supporting the local commercial uh, operations and businesses. They are interested about the social footprint uh, of the technology and the impact that it has. So recently, um, Growers uh, Produce Magazine, uh, Produce Grower Magazine, and uh, recognize seven people uh, who is driving the produce industry. And uh, they recognize these seven uh, unique individuals as the people in produce. Uh, we had three uh, uh, unique individuals from Arizona, so we are really proud. Uh, one of them was our colleague, Dr. Joel Kuala from our department, of Biosystems Engineering. We had the pleasure of having him to present in these Covering MIM seminars before. The second person was uh, Dr. Ricardo Hernandez, one of our graduates of this program. He is currently a faculty member at North Carolina State University. We hope to have him presenting also in the near future. But today, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce you the third unique special person who was named uh, as the people in produce, our guest speaker, Heather Zimura. Thank you. And she is the owner and uh, uh, farmer operator of her business, her container-based uh, farming operation. Um, uh, she comes with the global business marketing degree. I do. And she has experiences in corporate business world as manager. And then she decided to go into the uh, <laughs> uh, learning again. And uh, she uh, pursued a degree in a natural... Naturopath, yeah. Naturopath, paddock, paddock, uh, Medicine. Medicine. And then where she found really her passion in urban agriculture. So today it is a pleasure to have her to talk about her experiences, her business, Twisted Infusions, and we are happy to have you here. Thank you. And stage is yours. Thank you. So I'm Heather from Twisted Infusion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I am co owner, my husband here on the left, or that's your left, um, uh, bought the farm with me and we purchased the farm. Mm, Two years ago in 2016 and we really bought it as a part-time thing we were looking to do a business together and as a backstory my husband weighed 340 pounds five years ago and had a moment and changed his life and started to eat differently and eat healthy and there were a lot of things that he was eating that he was allergic to and we found out after an allergy test so he had been eating all these foods that we thought were healthy for him but to him they weren't so after the allergy test, we, um, I started to grow those things that were beneficial for him or beneficial for us from a natural medicine standpoint. And my son in the middle is 14 years old and he's allergic to ibuprofen and he's got some other allergies associated with healing. So natural healing was really important to us. Thus why I was going back to school to be a naturopath. And um, my husband and I look into own this business together, fast forward. And 
they said Freight Farms is the farm that I bought. It's a 40-foot shipping container. It's a refurbished meat container, so it had three inches of insulation all the way around already. And Freight Farms as a company um, added zip grow towers, which are vertical towers, and the lights and the technology and the dispensing of the nutrients. So it was a plug and play type option for us. And they said it would be a part-time job. So that was perfect for me. I was going to school to be a naturopath. I could do this on the side. My husband was a stay-at-home dad, so he had some time now that my kids were back in school full-time. And um, we got the farm. And come to find out, it's more than a part-time job. It was a little bit more than that. So um, I quit going to school because I absolutely fell in love with farming. And um, this is my daughter over here. But this is the reason that I farm, educating and um, instilling in my family that food is medicine and natural methods are important, and to educate others about that, urban farming specifically. When my um, kids were little, they would go swimming, and I'm not a laying out person. I don't, I'm not good at sitting still. And so I started a little four by four patch of earth and just started to garden in it, and I was good at it. It was, I couldn't believe it. I'm not a very domesticated person, so it was very interesting to see that. And then it just expanded. I started to take over my entire backyard. So I had this farming experience, I had this gardening experience, if you will, so I knew how to grow things. And I wanted to grow more, and I wanted to educate myself about growing more. So um, when we bought the farm, we got it, and um, we started growing lettuce and kale at first. This is an inside view of my farm. Um, here is the seedling table, and then those are the vertical zip grow towers, and then there's lights in the middle. They're LEDs, LED strips. And um, we started growing lettuce and kale because that was the easiest thing to grow, pretty, pretty standard. And I um, didn't want to go to farmer's markets. That was one of the things that I was concerned with. And so I started talking to chefs, and they didn't care about that much lettuce, or they didn't have that much need for this beautiful, perfect lettuce and buy the pound, a whole bunch of it. And so um, I started looking at growing other things. And so I started growing specialty produce. Here's um, a picture of my farm with the lights on. So you can see it's that pink and pink color, the pink hue. And then this is some of the specialty produce I grow. So a year in, we had a distributor come in and say, I would love to buy all your lettuce. But it's got to be this variety and it's got to be this weight. And I was like, that sounds really boring. I don't. I don't want to do that. And my husband's like, no, no, no. This is what every farmer is looking for, somebody to buy all their produce, and they get paid. And I, I, don't, I don't want to do that. It sounds really boring. So I started doing some research on some specialty produce of things that would grow um, in my farm at 65 degrees. And so this is oyster leaf. It's a leaf that tastes like oysters. That's a leaf that it's called salabrinette. tastes like cucumber. Sorrel tastes like citrus. And this is glacier lettuce, and it's got this funky color and thing to it. So I found that the chefs were much more interested in this type of product, and they'd never seen it before. And growing it in this perfect, ideal environment, it tastes the way it should. So I also have a wasabi arugula that tastes exactly like wasabi. That's incredible. But this is um, one of the things I liked about the freight farm. It had the technology already integrated into it, so I could control it all from an app in my house. And that was really important to me. Because I feel like by growing in a container, I probably could have built my own system, some NFT system or something like that. But this already had the technology, the app, everything. So that was really in intriguing for us to purchase. So the nice thing about this is I can check all these things from my house. And then it gives me graphs. So I can check it from a 12 hour, a one day, a one week. It gives me all the controls to turn off and on. However, most of this is automated. If I needed to get in and intervene, the option to do so is there. And that was probably the biggest selling point for me on the freight farm. So uh, one more comment about how what led me here today. Um, I started testing strawberries in the farm and really wanted to find those varieties that are hard to grow in Arizona, especially in Phoenix, where it's so hot. And we don't have a consistent winter, hardly ever 65 degrees for more than 20 days. So finding these strawberries that were unique and um, started growing them and I was really successful. And the Wall Street Journal from Australia called me and they were doing an article about growing strawberries in containers and how difficult it was based on pollination and not having enough pollination, having bees or something like that in there. 
And so um, I was featured on this article in the Wall Street Journal. And then Produce Growers Magazine had called me based off that. So that's kind of how I ended up here. But my strawberries are really my pride and joy. Um, I have six different varieties ready to go that are going to be planted in the next week. So I have a bunch of chefs that are interested in that type of thing. And so listening to the demand of the, of the chef has been leading me to different products as well. Now, I've talked to you about the, how to distribute. And then so working with chefs is very interesting. They don't always know what they want. <laughs> and they're artists. And so they have artist brains. And um, these are just some examples of some of the things that the chefs are doing with my food. And I'm very lucky to have um, worked with some of the best chefs in the state. There's Kevin Binkley, the larder in the Delta, Stephen Jones. Some of these chefs that are um, really world-renowned or country-renowned um, are buying produce from me, and it's stuff that they've never seen. They haven't had this kind of quality before. So there is a market for the super high-end quality, if you will, or the specialty produce, depending on where you're going, right? The most common household probably isn't looking for a flower garnish. So it was important for me to find the right market, essentially. And I was looking to do something different, something nobody else has done. I do also grow in the earth, but the hydroponic farm produces the most beautiful, most perfect, most delicious, the way it should be produce that you can get. So. Um, I kind of wanted to take more questions too. I'm pretty casual about all this. So what, you had some questions too. Go ahead. Hand. Oh, I'm sorry. She asked me how do you get um, pollination on the strawberries if you don't have bees in there or anything else. And I hand pollinated them. But I didn't have a full container full. And that was um, almost the debate on the strawberry growing is um, indoors. How do you get them to pollinate without hand doing it? Because having a full container, so I can grow almost equivalent of an acre and a half in the, in the shipping container. How would you do that with strawberries at that level? And um, I think that that would probably be a little bit more difficult. And that was what the, the problem they were having in the big grows was the germination or the pollination. Oh, yeah. By pollination, I mean by rubbing my hand on it. Yeah, or, um, I added some more wind to the back of the farm just for the strawberries, just to give it some extra oomph, if you could. I would. So with growing, so along with the berries, you're growing other things. You're growing your leafy greens and flowers and stuff like that. Did you find that you needed to alter your pH to maximize? No, so in the research I was doing, I really was looking for plants that would grow in that ideal environment. So looking for the colder weather, not needing nutrients like a, a tomato mite or a pepper mite. I mean, or an herb. I can't grow basil in the same farm as I do the leafy greens. So they require a different nutrient and a warmer temperature. So there were some limitations that I was based off of, of those parameters. But no, I really did the research to find stuff that would grow within my current environment without changing it. Because you can't... Um, I couldn't segment half my farm as this and half my farm as that. So it all had to be on the same nutrient and the same weather tolerance, if you will. Are you still growing in dirt too? I am. I do both. And one of the things that I like to do in the earth is um, grow a lot of this in the winter outside and show chefs the difference. So if I were to grow, for example, the glacier lettuce, when I grow the glacier lettuce inside my farm, it tastes like eating a glass of water, pure water. But when you grow it in the earth, it tastes like salt water. And then when you grow it hydroponically outdoors, it has a combination of both. Very interesting. So some chefs like one or the other, but showing them the difference between that has been really um, interesting because this is so much better. One of your first slides. I think it's 256. 256. Thank you. On one of your earlier slides, you had 1,400 parts per million for CO2. How did you arrive at that figure? Um, well, a lot of that was pre-set up. So it just kind of came standard for a leafy green. This is what you should be at. Um, I didn't really mess with that too much. It was almost like a standard setting, if you will, for leafy greens. What's 
the perfect strawberry. What's the perfect strawberry by choice? And uh, what would the chefs say is the very best that will please their consumers most? Unfortunately or fortunately, chefs are varied. <laughs> but um, I think that most chefs don't know the difference. They only get access to one or two kinds of strawberries in theory, what we're limited to grow locally or what their distributor can get them. So alpine strawberries are more of a delicate strawberry. And there's within alpine strawberries probably five to ten different varieties of alpines. Okay. They have yellow, white, some red. And so that was more what I tried to focus on because they are so delicate that they have a hard time growing outdoors. Uh, any that are giant and no. absolutely tasty? And uh, <laughs> apparently, or what I've come to terms with is chefs like everything small, anything tiny. So a lot of the course menus, course plates, they're looking for tiny. And so it's been interesting to also work with um, Growing hydroponically, sometimes you can limit the root, root space of some plants. For instance, I tried to grow tomatoes in some of those zip grow towers out front, outside, and um, the root space was limited. Therefore, the tomatoes came out really small. It was perfect for my chefs. I was disappointed, but they loved it. And so working and experimenting with plants that I can restrict root growth to make them dwarf plant, dwarf fruit, there's some, there's some flowers, edible flowers, that if I do that with, they become miniatures and the chefs love it so I try to listen to what they're looking for if you will they like anything tiny so the strawberries the smaller the strawberry they love it and they're looking for quality really I mean that that would be the difference I think than um, maybe selling at a farmers market not that they're not looking for quality but they're not looking for garnish you appear to be somewhat of an individualist <laughs> hence my question that's a great question. He asked me earlier, where did Twisted Infusions come about? And once upon a time, before this was really getting going, I was infusing a lot of my herbs and my hot peppers with um, coconut oil for cooking purposes. And so thus the infusions. And like you said, I'm, I'm kind of a weirdo or a, I'm different. And so we're, we're a little twisted anyway. <laughs> and so we, we really, I would use the word evolved from um, infusing oils. And now with the hydroponic indoor farm, the outdoor hydroponics, the earth farm, I work with a local beekeeper to provide um, local honey, raw unfiltered honey. I work with a local quail farmer to get quail eggs. And I work with a, a microgreen farmer. So I can't do all that. I don't have a lot of space. And I prefer to support other local urban farmers and that have the same vision I do. And before I'll sell any of their product to my chefs, I have to go and inspect their place and make sure that they're doing everything they say they're doing. So make sure they're pesticide free, that kind of stuff. So that's really important to me. So you, you mentioned um, earlier about the flavors, the taste of the different things that you're growing. Do you mess around with your nutrient mix or play around with microbials or anything like that to enhance your flavors? That's a really good question. No, I really haven't because I only have the one freight farm. I'm intimidated about a lot of experimentation because I don't want to ruin what, I, although I have almost 17 variety of crops growing in there right now. So it's quite a bit and um, I'm just afraid or intimidated about losing one or the other right. on experimenting. Um, we plan on moving the farm here in the next three months to a bigger location and getting and acquiring more container farms. More than likely, I wouldn't buy another freight farm. I would make my own. I think there's some improvements to be made. And I think not everything needs to grow vertically this way. The lettuce, most plants, right, they grow out and up, so it kind of elbows. And for lettuce, it doesn't necessarily contribute to the overall success, but most of the people I'm dealing with like the mini heads. So if I was really going to go after that better head, the bigger head, more of a lettuce market, I would definitely go horizontal vertical. So what improvements would you make on the, on the farm? Oh, so much. <laughs> There's just, it's more, I would suggest it's more um, just that because it's vertical. So because these are vertical this way, and they're really close together, you can see, 
I mean, we jammed 200, I mean, Brick Farms jams 256 towers in there. So they're really close to each other. And sometimes that um, doesn't allow them to fully grow or some things get shaded or there's just some design flaws within that. So I think that um, there's, I like the way that some, some of my plants grow vertically, but for the most part, the lettuce, the kale, those kinds of things I think would be better off horizontal vertical. They just would grow better. So I know these, that sounds weird. these towers, what the nutrients come from the top and it's gravity feeds through each of the So um, that's a great question. So there's a main tank in the back there and then there's a pump. So when the water turns on, it comes through the top and goes down a drip emitter system down the back of the tower. So it's just watering the roots down the back. And then it drains down from the back of the tower into this tray, if you will, and back into the tank and recycles. So when it drips down, is it like a drip system like in your garden where all of them are getting fed at the same time? Mm -hmm. Or is it like this one gets fed and then this one? Then this no, one? no, they all get fed at the same time. And it's a two gallon per hour drip emitter. So what is it about that design that has some getting better nutrients than others? I don't think it's necessarily, they're all getting the same nutrients. I just think that they're some of, because of the way that some of the heads would grow, either really big, then the ones behind that, because it's so close together, would have struggle. Does that make sense? So it just needs to be, for me, this farm needs to be designed a little bit differently. <laughs> Um, can you describe your distribution logistics and schedule, like with the chefs? It's a great question. And um, unfortunately, not all chefs like the delivery on the same day. So I um, try to do it by area. And um, it's just me. So I'm the only one harvesting and delivering. And they know that. A lot of the chefs have been to my farm, so they've seen it and they get it. Um, and so their, their demands may be a little bit high, but they under, there's some understanding there, I guess, with that distribution. So, but I harvest and deliver within 24 hours. So I don't harvest a bunch of lettuce and then go, oh my gosh, I have 50 pounds, you guys gotta buy, you gotta buy, you gotta buy, because then it goes bad. So I've really um, come to terms with the harvest the day of or within 24 hours of delivery. It really makes it last. Say that again. Well, I, every week I'm harvesting something. And for the past two weeks, I've sold out my farm. So I'm, I need to grow more. Can you rotate your, your plants rather than just fix area? Would that, you did any study in rotation in the LED? Um, not really. Could you repeat that? The question was, would you prefer rotating the vertical towers rather than keeping them stationary? I just don't, farm? I don't think that the entire farm should be vertical towers is what I'm suggesting. I don't think that would alleviate my, my issue per se. I think it's just a space issue. And then in, in the vertical, on growing vertical towers, some plants just don't perform as well and you'll get a lot of leaking or dripping and then it falls on the next plant beneath it, and then that's ruined, you know? So there's some level of frustration with the vertical. However, it's really efficient, and I can fit a lot in there. Mix the motions, if you will. Um, I learned that um, the vertical system has a um, the advan advantage of uh, more uniform temperature distribution, so it's do you have a more uniform um, grocery for the different crops? I'm wondering, will this system help you to achieve a very uniform grocery for the different crops or not? I feel like it does. I feel like it's a uniform airflow. I feel like I have uniform temperature. There are some spots that maybe are a couple degrees off, but not by five or 10 degrees. I don't have that kind of variation in my farm at all. So I think that from a perspective of consistency and nutrients and airflow in temperature, it's in there. Because it's a small environment, right? So it, it, it works. You get it set, right? <laughs> Those who did not get a chance to ask these questions, I will definitely come back to that. Yes, please. OK, go ahead. So along the same lines of consistency, do you find that the, the genomes of the, the seeds for these products are consistent enough to give you a consistent product, or do you need to clone to do that? I don't do any cloning. 
I start everything from seed. So that's been a little bit interesting too, specifically on the strawberries, right? Most, most people don't sell strawberry seeds. And so um, finding sources that sell quality seed is not as easy as you'd like to think. It's hard. That was basically my question. Yeah. And so um, there are some reputable seed companies out there like Johnny's and, and Burpee's and, and rareseeds.com is, is fantastic. But it also depends on the, the plant, like the oyster leaf, its germination rate is like 40% if you don't do it right. <laughs> so there's some tricks of the trade with some plants that you have to cater to that germination rate and they're just naturally that. So it's not necessarily a matter of the seed. I mean, lettuce and kale and, and some of those other greens, their germination rate is 98% most of the time. And so that's really easy. But with some of the specialty produce, the seed germination varies. And it's not necessarily quality of seed, it's plant. A couple of dumb questions, perhaps. One of which would be, in your new adventure, would LED lighting be a consideration? Or? The only consideration, probably. I'm thinking of saving you money and all sorts <laughs> of other things here. I like the LED. And the other uh, thing that strikes me is once you take the strawberry off the plant, you still have a plant. Mm -hmm. And once the plant basically gets to a certain point, have you come up with any original ideas about what to do with the rest over of the plant to either eat or create into something else? Good question. And um so the interesting thing, I have um, two snakes, a bearded dragon, and two tarantulas. And so I have to feed them rats and crickets on a bi-weekly basis, weekly basis. And the pet shop owner, um, I give him all my waste. So we trade rats and crickets for greens. So I don't have any waste. I'm, um, I'm just about zero waste. The other improvements we made to the farm, um, originally when we got the farm, we were adding 15 gallons of water a day. And instead of buying, buying an RO system, which debate on water is another conversation, but um, we didn't want to waste. We wanted to be as sustainable as possible. And so we were going to our local water store and buying their RO water, but they were testing weekly, testing constantly or whatever. And so um, I was getting really sick and tired of hauling water. <laughs> so um, my husband and I went into some research on the AC water. And so the AC that's going, we refilter that water and it goes back into our tank and then we have a dehumidifier and that refilters that water and it goes back into our tank. We are at zero water. We don't add any water anymore. So it's really gotten sustainable. The hard part is the energy. So the energy would be probably the main cost that I have the highest cost. Yes. There, there is one in, in um, Phoenix that they have. And um, yeah, I, I haven't really participated with any of the co-ops, the seed co-ops or really. I feel like um, most of that stuff tends to be native or common, if you will, um, easy to propagate, you know. So, uh, and, and I'm not really looking for that. I'm looking for the funky. <laughs> I have nine different kinds of basil. So, and I've probably tested over 50 varieties of lettuce. There's over 100 varieties of lettuce out there. So I'm on a mission to try to, try to test at least all of them, or at least come close, you know. And, and I've, what I found, and we were kind of having this conversation earlier, is what lettuce would be good production lettuce? Maybe some of this lettuce isn't being grown anymore because it's not good for production or it doesn't do well for this. And there's a lot of those. They just don't produce well. And that's probably why we've evolved from them. But there's more than just iceberg and romaine. There's a whole bunch of different kinds. And, and trying to educate people about that concept as well. Just the concept that there's something else out there that you can look for. It doesn't have to always be this way. OK, and from out in the ethernet, what are your thoughts about your hydroponic shipping container versus an aquaponic shipping container? Um, I, I think I would, um, I would, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that, but aquaponics in an enclosed environment like that seems interesting. I, I'm not sure that I would go aquaponics in a container. Uh, I don't know. There wouldn't be a lot of room, I would think. 
That would be interesting. I've not really considered that question. I would love to grow aquaponically. I find it totally fascinating. However, I'd probably do it outdoors, just from a perspective of space. And I think um, with aquaponics, so much different filtering has to occur. And I think that um, I would probably put that outside, just for me, more of a preference probably than anything. And I don't have a lot of experience with aquaponics in an enclosed environment, so I don't really know. Hi. Very, very good. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Um, you have one container right now. Yes. And to expand, you have to get a second container that, that you're going to design is going to be better than this one. What about when you hopefully. get to the third? Oh, no, not hopefully. It will be <laughs> In theory, yes. Have that positive attitude. <laughs> um, what about the third, the fourth, the fifth container? And might you consider when you get that many containers just moving into a building somewhere? That's a great Any question. Thoughts? Um, it's definitely the conversation that my husband and I debate on. He's, um, he's my operations man. I mean, he is so good at engineering and figuring out things, how to grow very um, aquaponic, or hydroponically educated about systems. And so um, that would probably be his choice at some point after four. And we've talked about that. What do you, how do you go into a warehouse and make that financially viable with food? Because currently, the most of the grows that I see that are doing that type of growing are cannabis grows. And, but the money's there, so they can afford that type of overhead. And so finding a way to make food viable from a financial perspective to grow in a warehouse would be the interesting part in the analysis that we would have to come to, I think. And by growing in a warehouse, you mean at such large volumes, which means you need more labor. It's not just you anymore. Yeah. Can, can you, um, would you be willing to give us any idea of the sale price of your, of your product? What, what I have you... no problem sharing some of that sale price. In fact, um, I do get, um, I have a lot of people tell me my prices are high, but they don't have any waste. So there's some level that I ask Chess to look at and consider the whole picture as opposed to just this cost. Um, I sell my lettuce and my kale for $8 a pound. Everything else goes for $5 an ounce. Do you have a good Italian restaurateur <laughs> who likes to make up special pizzas and special uh, I do. Uh, various Not necessarily pizzas. Italian, so but I have some there. French herbs and I have some shizo, so I have some Japanese. I have quite a few sushi restaurants that are interested. But a lot of the chefs that I work with, they change every week. They change their meals or their chef plate or their chef menu every week. So it's kind of interesting what they pick and choose and they order varieties every week sometimes they change sometimes they stay the same it's unfortunately it's one of those catch 22s with working with chefs is it's not necessarily distributor or consistent but it's sure fun and i think i would um one of the other reasons i didn't go to farmers market i pictures of my kids they have activities every saturday i wasn't willing to sacrifice my saturdays for that and i can't imagine explaining this to the general public on a daily basis or a weekly basis. I think that I'll go a little crazy. I mean, we were talking about some of the ignorance of, of just understanding for growing. I had a grown man say, it takes two weeks to grow lettuce, right? Like, just plant it today and it'll be ready next week. I was like, no, no clue, really, that, that there's 55 days from seed to head? None. So the education process to me is important. However, I struggle to educate the public and the farmers market forum the chefs that are educating foodies um, has really made a difference because the foodies care or people that are going to these types of restaurants care about it and they're asking i've never had a leaf that tastes like oysters before where would you get something like that i never even knew this existed that kind of comments i love I've had chefs work from around the world and they have never seen produce like what I'm growing. Just hasn't existed a lot before now. But they're starting to ask questions and we're starting to get there. So that's good. And I can't grow enough for everybody, so I think everybody should grow food. Well, you can really extend this to things like rutabagas and all <laughs> uh, ethnic foods in different parts of the world. 
I take custom requests. I've grown a couple custom orders for chefs, Better including speaking. many radishes. So I've done some experiences with uh, root vegetables in the farm as well. Carrots do really well. They end up, so the towers, right, the zip growth towers are only about this big. So if I put a carrot in there, how big does it get? <laughs> you know, about this big, perfect for chefs. They like it mini. So the mini carrots have sold really well, actually. I do purple mini carrots because the purple. Heather, speaking of education, you also you mentioned about expanding your operation, the second, the third, and the fourth container coming up in the near future. Would you uh, share with us your thoughts and your needs about your future uh, team members, and where do you see the need uh, uh, for the future operation? Um, well, a lot of that is going to start with me. Um, one of the problems that I have right now, and I was explaining this tomorrow, I have so much variety in there, and I'm doing this on my own. I've been doing this for so long. Sometimes I know when it needs to be harvested, but maybe if you walked into my farm, you wouldn't know because you don't know. So I need to really get to a point of putting down processes and making this more seamless and also reducing the number of crops that I'm growing. I mean, that would be a big thing to help me get labor. <laughs> So moving forward, I have to simplify my process. And talking about the second, and third, fourth container, I'd love to do one container the leafy greens, or one container herbs, one container edible flowers. And then I want my own experiment one. You know, I love experimenting, and I love trying all these different things. So there's some level that I would segment that way. And from that, from what I've seen of people that are master growers or master gardeners or people that have had education, they tend to like to go with tomatoes, or they go with peppers, or they go with herbs, or they go, they kind of have their specialty with what they grow. And so I would be looking for somebody that, if I were doing an, an herb farm, somebody that liked to grow herbs, or knew about herbs, somebody that knew about edible flowers and the process of growing them. However, I don't think that there's a lot of people like that in my circle today. So it would be interesting to try to seek that out and, and truly understand who has that knowledge, because I, I really don't know in terms of an employee. Most of the people I talk to own their own farms. <laughs> Could you expand on that for a person who has no idea what that really means? And it sounds like you inject, you said, coconut oil or such into a particular food substance. Now, I, I can visualize the biochemistry of what's going on in the plant a bit. But there may be some very exciting things that are going on in different. I, 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 I can imagine an exciting carrot that got infused with some special formula that you came up with that would basically sell because of just being the different. novelty of it. But, right. but good science still should be part of it. It would be the opposite of that. I was infusing plants into oils. Okay. Not oils into plants. Okay. Now, I wouldn't know how to do that. Does anybody ever do that? I don't think they blend um, okay. from an um, emulsion standpoint. Okay. I learned something. <laughs> okay, another one from online here. Do you turn off your grow lights in the day to avoid the peak electricity rates, or are you on a flat rate power schedule? That's a great question. Um, APS changed the timing schedule of our hive, so we switched the farm. Everything turns off and on automatically. The water turns on automatically. The lights turn on automatically. So, yeah, we set it for that lower peak season. That was really, because it's my largest expense, it's the one I have to cater to the most. And we've been approached by some solar companies to solarize. The hard part is it's just not um, economic, economically feasible for me today to solarize one farm. It runs on about 100 kilowatts a day. Oh, it's okay. So um, it would be quite a few panels just to run the one farm. I really like the sustainability option of that. And when I get more farms, I do anticipate going solar. It would be huge. Okay, another one from online. What's the yield of the strawberries? And are any changes with the lighting? Or did you keep the lighting settings the same as other leafy plants? kept the lighting the same. The production from the strawberries, um, I had two varieties in there. One produced fantastic and amazing and just produced like I felt it would in the earth. 
because that was the only other experience I had with it. Um, good production, really good. Oh, no issues there. Two part question. Uh oh, you're gonna wait for the mic. You're gonna get in trouble. No, I, I think people can hear me. <laughs> Question. What was your biggest success, your best success, and what was your worst failure? Oh, there have been so many failures. <laughs> learning, um, experience. learning experiences um, from a failure perspective was understanding what comes into the farm stays in the farm. So um, being careful about working in my earth garden and then coming into the indoor farm. Being very cognizant of who comes into my farm and where have they been? I had um, some farmers, friends that had come over, but they were working in their garden before they came over, not even realizing it, and then they're stepping in my farm. And I had no idea. So um, I've taken some different measures from that perspective to control what comes into the farm, um, including bad energy. So like if my husband and I are fighting, he's not allowed in the farm. Because there's no bad energy in my farm. It's a metal box and energy never dies. So if you bring bad energy in there, you have to convert it some way to good. And it's much harder. So um, there's no bad energy in my farm. You don't allow it. It's harder to clean. My biggest success, I would say, is from a personal standpoint, that oyster leaf. I can't get over it. it um, I had to order the seeds from France. And so they took me two weeks to get them. And then you have to put them in the fridge for six weeks before you can put them in the seedling tank for another four weeks. So it was quite a process just to get to a leaf. And the plant smells like the ocean. It's incredible. It's, it's an amazing plant. And I don't know many other people growing oyster leaf. So I consider it one of my prides. The seedling tank is right here. And it holds all the water. And this is a seedling tray, or for lack of a better word. And then this pumps, floods, and drains the seedling tray every eight hours. I don't have to do anything. Um, I put them in 200 trays. I now use plugs. I don't make my own. I buy them from um, a place in California. There's no um, Phoenix plug makers that would work in the volume that I'm doing. I try to buy as local as possible if I can. I try to seek those purveyors. Um, so I had another question about working with the chefs. Yeah. So you said the chefs don't a lot of times know what they want, which I've experienced as well. Um, now, how do you introduce these different things to them? Do you just do small quantities of new things, show them, and then start growing them in larger quantities when they want them, or how does that work? That's a great question. I definitely experiment with, let's say, five or six towers, and then, yeah, hey, do you like this? Or if it doesn't grow, I've done that, where I've planted five or six towers and it came out really bad. Um, arugula grows really, really strong. And so does celery. Celery, and it grew amazing, beautiful. But it was so celery, and it was so arugula-y, <laughs> so peppery, that nobody wanted it. It was too strong. So there's such a thing. And so I would say that that has been more uh, testing it that way, realizing how strong it is. And hey, chef, do you like this? No, I can't use that. Um, then I won't grow anymore. <laughs> and it and that's all the only thing they can do for it. But they're buying celery so cheap over here that it wasn't worth it to them to buy it from me. So I um, dried it, and actually I used the celery powder myself, and it's fantastic. Super strong. I don't need a lot. <laughs> you mentioned things getting in. So have you had a pest problem? I um, had a little one. And um, in an indoor environment, it gets out of control very quickly. So it's definitely been something to watch. Uh, we have released ladybugs before, which is like my favorite. It's a favorite thing to do. But yeah, like the neem oil and, and things like that, I, I try to be as minimal as possible. But it's important. I have had one in two years, and it was small. But I clean a lot. One of the nice things about metal is you can sanitize it. <laughs> I'm all about sanitizing because I can't sanitize outside. I can't control anything really outside except for my seed and my water. So I really like that aspect of cleaning. <laughs> the 
the Asian market? Not an issue. Um, there's just, what I found with the sushi chefs is, like for Shizo, for example, they're used to green and they're used to it being uniform and they're used to it looking a certain way. Well, things don't really grow that way in theory. I mean, in the big scheme of things, not everything grows the same or the same shape, size, what have you. So um, it's educating some of those chefs about this is the way the plant grows and I'm not doing anything to it to make everything consistent the way you're used to buying it, where it's like a press or something like that. Uh, I'm not doing that. So there's been some education process and there's some chefs that don't want to give up their ways. You know, this is what they're used to, this is what they're doing. The, um, the sushi chefs in particular have been very interesting and hit and miss for me. They, they like what they like. But I, I try to grow a bigger variety. Like I said, I had nine different kinds of basil. I try to grow four or five different kinds of sage. I typically grow the super hots. I like super hot peppers in the earth. So I have a variety of about 10 different super hots right now. So it's about being different for me. Questions? So if you're growing a ton of different varieties or crops in your system, uh, how, is your, how are you fertigating them? As in, are you using the same, is the system using the same nutrient solution for every single plant? Okay. And then are you adding, adding anything to that? No like microbial tea or nothing. It's just what freight farms provided you with. Um, no, well, the nutrient solution, I, I get the AM Hydro the lettuce nutrients from AM Hydro. And, and like I said, I'm just intimidated on experimenting. Not that I don't think that microbes or some of those other beneficial modes would be positive and be helpful. I'm just intimidated about trying it on my one farm. And with the variety of crops, I, I guess I'm intimidated that it'll affect three and not anything else. And then it's like, okay, well now I can't grow those anymore, but everything else is fine. I need to evolve to a point where I am growing less crops in general. So I'm sure I will get to that point when I have more, a lot, you know, figure that out right. Because I would, I would assume that the different beneficial stuff would be different for each plant. So I'm sure there's something different for tomatoes than there would be for herbs, I would assume. Heather, maybe you More mentioned, uh, maybe I missed that. Do you use CO2 enrichment in your container? Not enrichment. It's just set at that PPM. And, and then so if it falls below, it just automatically turns on. Uh, propane yeah, tank. The source propane tank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, propane on the outside. The CO2 generator runs off propane. So there, there's a CO2 generator, which is a burner, mm -hmm. and it burns propane inside the grow room. I don't ever smell propane inside my farm, so I, I, I guess I'm saying yes, but no, I don't. Well, yeah, yeah. You, you wouldn't smell you it, know. but okay. I haven't had any issues per se with that. Okay. And, and your tomatoes were fine, you said? they were. I don't small. grow tomatoes in the farm. I grew them outdoors on a hydroponic wall. Oh, okay. All right. These same towers I take and I have them outside. I have several walls outside because I can't grow the herbs inside the farm, but I want to grow them hydroponically. That's why I got them. So I've tried and tested some of more of the tomatoes or the peppers or herbs on the outdoor zip grow towers. I, I feel a bit obligated just to ask you to be careful about burning gas is inside a closed system. Sure. It's usually not recommended. In fact, I would never recommend it. Yeah. Please be careful. Okay. Like I said, when I design my own farm, it'll be different. This is a freight farm design. So they haven't had anybody blow up yet. So I'm thinking I might be okay. Right. And they talked about that at the beginning and um, different ways of noticing that or finding that out. Yeah, I haven't had anything remotely close to that yet. So, but we are aware of it, and we do talk about it. But I haven't had it happen yet. 
Mm. Yes, sir. There's some freight farmers in different parts of the country. Now, we're the only one in Arizona to have a freight farm, but in other parts of the country, so for here it was nice because we can't grow anything in the summer in theory. But so to have leafy greens at 65 degrees in the middle of summer is dreamy. But for other places, um, it's really about the cold weather that these are built for. And they use their intake and exhaust fan a little bit more often than I do. I don't use it at all. Okay, and I actually have no idea what this one means, but uh, but I'm sure most people here do. Have you used any light recipes to change the nutritional content of your produce? No. And no. Hey, this is amazing. I'm so excited about your project. Thank you. Your business. <laughs> I was wondering how often do you uh, completely drain and reconstitute your uh, nutrient solution mix? Um, well, the containers that hold the nutrient solutions are about this big. So as soon as they're out, I clean it out, fill it back up. Okay, so all the water's lost through evapotranspiration. Um, does, it ever, does the nutrient ever get concentrated? Do you ever notice any deficiencies or weird things that, happening? That's a great question. So usually that's caused by light, right? That degrades the nutrients. So we had ours, um, our nutrient containers hydro dipped, and so they're covered so light doesn't get in there. So it's really reduced a lot of those um, initial issues that I think we had at the beginning. But we blacked them out. All right, thank you. So this is from Freight Farms. I'm not sure they're located, but did they just like roll this up to your property and drop it off? It's a great question. Yeah, they're in Boston. And, um, yeah, it came on a, um, a flatbed, and they just rolled it off into my backyard. It was a pretty awesome process. <laughs> and what pest exclusion protocols do you have? And once you have an infestation, how do you eradicate the pests or virus? Um, well, with the first situation that I had, it was time to um, um, clean out some of the farm things anyway. So we completely cleaned out the farm. There's a company in Phoenix called Procure, and they're working on some interesting things with indoor farming and um, sanitizing. And so they have a, a program to clean an indoor facility. And so I followed their program for the first time and um, had zero issues. And it was um, hospital clean after it was done. So we started out fresh. But um, I haven't, I only had the one time a pest issue, so I don't really, the maintenance and, and, and being careful about what's coming in there and maybe some small problems, but I haven't had more than one issue before. Okay, and from another person, have you ever grown sorrel for greens? Yeah, I have the red sorrel and the green sorrel. I have both. Um, the green sorrel is better, <laughs> but the red sorrel is pretty. Some people like pretty, some people like flavor. And any issues with uh, mold or mildew? No, I haven't had any of those issues at all, actually. I'm, I would assume because I'm keeping it clean and, and uh, I have to really watch those drips like I was talking about. Some of those drips can cause issues. And so being aware and being in there all the time has really helped facilitate not having those issues. Okay. And then... Um... Do any of your customers require any uh, food safety certifications? Not at this time. Um, I believe in the state of Arizona, um, you have to be certified once you're selling $100,000 of one crop. And I'm not even close to that yet. I'd like to be, but I'm not. For a distributor, there is different certifications that are required. and. Um, I'm just not growing enough to justify the expense of the certification. And I, don't, I prefer not to sell through a distributor at this point, so I'm not looking to do that anytime soon. Heather, you using a control system, you're generating a lot of data and you are looking at it to manage your facility. Uh, it is, was there anybody interested in your data to 
to uh, work on it and do something with it? Anybody approached you without the data that you <laughs> no, have? No, no, they haven't. Not really. Um, we've had, since we're, like I said, we're the only people in Arizona to have one, we had quite a few interesting visitors. The Navajo Nation came and visited us at the beginning, which was awesome to see because they have such problems with their land and water. Um, one, of the, one of the troubles that they have with this particular situation is it's not Mother Earth. It's not natural in theory for them. Um, so there's differences that way. But the, nobody's come in and asked me to analyze my data and help me. You want to do that? Is that what you're asking? Sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, questions. Uh, please, wait, wait. That's a great question. We've been um, in talking about new farm designs or new container designs. How would we utilize something like natural light more effectively because it's always sunny? <laughs> um, it's, I have mixed, we have mixed emotions about it based on the heat that it could generate. And maybe for herbs or something that would be a little bit more heat tolerant, that might be a better way to, to design a container. I firmly believe that it would be with the ability to close it. But then I, I wonder about the cost, right? Like it all boils down to cost at some point because we are just growing food. And at some point there's gotta be some consideration there. And, and that's been the hard part for me. It's trying to find crops that I can educate people about that are gonna grow that way. But at some point it becomes a cost issue. Because like to that point of growing 17 different crops, I'm not maximizing my money on, on one crop. If I was growing one crop and growing the whole container out of it, my price would be lower. I could sell more of it. I just, I need more farming. <laughs> I need to grow more and, and really boil down to a few crops that are sellable to the chef. Wasabi arugula would be my first one. I may be way out of line suggesting this, but broccoli and cauliflower also come to mind. I'm not infusing them with oil. <laughs> Some people eat them. <laughs> I grow purple cauliflower in the earth and Romanesco. Well, it's becoming Who would have thought cauliflower? Have your chefs ever expressed interest in, or have you considered trying to grow mushrooms? Um, yes, uh, the, a lot of the chefs I work with like mushrooms, and um, I work with a, another local farmer who grows mushrooms, and he grows specialty mushrooms, and there's a whole other art and a science to mushrooms that um, I would really have to educate myself about before I did. And that's one of the cool things I think about being a small farm, is working with these other small farmers like a mushroom farmer and he going to his place and seeing what he's doing and him educating me about all the things and he's starting to grow in a container as well so seeking other container farmers has been interesting but yeah i would i love the mushroom game i'm just not growing mushrooms but i like supporting that and offering that to my chefs especially the funky ones like he's growing lion's mane and like blue oysters they're just really crazy good uh, you mentioned uh, recapturing water from your air conditioning system or the dehumidification systems. What kind of filtration do you have to apply to that water to get it back to your RO quality standard? And I would suggest it's not quite RO quality. It's a little less, but it is a three-part system standard filtering system. It's the red, the, the yellow, and the purple, or whatever. And, and, and I apologize. My... Um, my husband was supposed to be here today, but um, he has a disability and he was not feeling well. But he really does a lot of that operational stuff for me and um, helps me learn that. And so, or he just does it for me so I don't have to learn. But we make a good team and he does a lot more of that kind of looking at than I do. You mentioned that you raised a lot of strawberries. Uh, is there a specific one that grows well in a tropical environment? Like 
Um, I would have to look because um, you really start to get into day bearing or ever bearing and, and those different types of genres of strawberries and then going from there versus the climate. So the ones I'm growing in here, they were uh, ever bearing. So they just kind of consistently grow. I've not really looked in the tropical environment because I don't have anything close to that to achieve a tropical environment here. A lot more humidity. And I don't know. And growing in an enclosed environment with a higher humidity sounds like the mold, inviting mold or inviting some of those other issues. We're pretty good at humidity. It's less than 60% most of the time. Ton. And um, after we got the farm, there were some modifications we made and we added two or three fans in addition to what they already had. The wind flow was much more important than I anticipated. And I took that for granted a lot, the growing in the earth. It just happens. Yeah, I never thought. I, and Arizona's not like a windy city, but it's really important. And I didn't realize that when I got the farm, my husband's like, we need to add two, two more fans. And I, I don't understand. And you could really tell a difference in the plants based off that. It was a big difference. They weren't so leggy. So kind of getting closer to our ending. Uh, maybe one last question, one final question. Anybody? All right. OK. So this question's about the solution. Now, with the hydroponic solution, you know, the moment that the plant takes some nutrients out of solution, solution changes, becomes saltier. So as this goes through and goes back, does it have some kind of filter there? Does it just expel what went through? Does no, there's some filters built in. There's one on the pump, and then um, as it drains back into the tank, there's a screen on the thing, so that big particles or big leaves are not going back into my tank, right? per se. And I haven't really experienced the saltiness of that. I don't really have a salt. So, so when it comes back, when it goes through the filter, that filters out any free salts. So you're, you're back to original composition. Then. In theory, yeah. And you're not using that big of a container to begin with. So. Right. I think okay. the main tank in the back, um, at most, will hold 140 gallons. And 140 gallons last a week? Um, well, I ha it continues to last. I don't ever refill it. But I don't fill it to a full 140. I'm just suggesting that it's capable of holding that. Right. So we must put something back into it, right? What do you mean, something? Nutrients? The nutrients are automatically dispensed. So there's a sensor in there that says, oh, the EC is low, or the pH is too high, or okay. there's sensors. I apologize. All right, no, I understand. Yeah, it's all automated that way. And that, I mean, like I said, that was the attraction to it, Right. the technology. Being able to control my farm from my house has been huge. And I take it inside your, your app, it doesn't have um, things in there like when to harvest it or oh, no. when to do different things for a certain mm -mm. item. Nothing no. Like that. And um, my problem is um, the crop management definitely has been, I have so many crops, how do you manage that cycle-wise? And because I harvest, when you order, I don't necessarily have a good consistent idea of I generate X amount of pounds from this plant or X amount of plant right. pounds from this. And that's been my struggle a little bit um, from an analyzation standpoint. However, I'm having so much fun and I'm really enjoying what I'm doing and the chefs are really liking what I'm putting out. So it's kind of working from that perspective. But as I grow, I definitely need to add more of that crop management concepts into my day into my life, into my business. <laughs> so how do you go about finding all these weird seeds? Um, that's a good question. Rareseeds.com is probably one of my favorite. Yeah, okay. They've got some really, really unique seeds from all over the world that it makes it easy to see, Right. research. And then um, I am, a lot of my chefs have been on Chopped, and Chopped has a lot of like weird produce too. So I'll watch different funky shows that have highlighting different things. 
and I'll go look it up. My husband will catch me on a Saturday night looking on the computer at seeds. I'm not looking at porn anymore, you know, or, or the bad things anymore. I'm looking at seeds on a Saturday night, and I'm hoping he doesn't look over my shoulder to see how much I'm spending because I love buying seeds. It's a problem. So do you ever consider just letting one of the plants go to seed? I do. And then I have. Grab in the, I mean, is it more complex procedure? Than Sometimes that? it's a mess. Sometimes it doesn't ever go to flower because it's that same temperature, right? Most, some of the plants will tend to bolt when it's a temperature issue, or typically it's temperature, I find, but, or time. But uh, I don't typically let them go to seed anymore because of the mess. Little value there. Wonderful. Excellent. Um, Heather, thank you so of much. Of course. We're thrilled to have you here and uh, sharing your experiences, your world of urban agriculture, your world uh, with us. So it was really great. The format was really uh, very open and flexible, informal. A lot of questions. I really enjoyed that. And we wish you success for your operation. Thank you, sir. And please let us know how we can support you as well. There are a oh, lot I of will. students sitting here, and then they will. Uh, soon be uh, graduating and you're expanding your operations so we would like to work with you and support you as best as we can thank you and for I those of the you, help we are there to support you please let us know. <laughs> and those of you joining us today thank you for joining us uh before you leave there's still food back there and also there's some produce in the kitchen thanks to uh our uh stacy stacy uh her students uh, produce coming from our teaching greenhouse. Please take and take home and enjoy it. And those of you joining us from the web, uh, thank you for uh, being with us today. And we look forward to seeing you for the next presentation that is, I believe, end of November. And that will be our final uh, seminar presentation for the covering environments that will be on November uh, 30th. And we will have another unique uh, presentation. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much again. Thank you. Thank you, sir.